In the previous video, we talked about possible topologies and core components of switched mode power supplies. Now let's go into detail and take a close look at secondary switched power supplies, especially step up and step down converters. If you haven't seen the previous video, we recommend to watch it first. You can find the link in the video description. Secondary switched power supplies have no galvanic isolation between their primary and secondary side. The input DC voltage is often generated by a 50 Hz transformer and the following rectifier, but can also come from other types of DC voltage sources such as batteries. While in our last video we dealt with switched capacitors, in this video our focus will be on switched mode power supplies with inductors, which are by far the most widely used converters. The first type of switched mode power supply we want to discuss is the buck converter or also called step down converter. As the name suggests, its output voltage is lower than its input voltage. It is often used as replacement for linear voltage regulators because of its higher efficiency. The design of such a circuit is rather simple. The input capacitor is needed to stabilize the input voltage. Without it, a current flow could cause an unwanted voltage drop due to the inductance of the trace. After that, there are two switches, a MOSFET and the flyback diode. The inductor and the output capacitor complete the circuit. They are needed to supply the load during the off time of the transistor. There are two modes of operation. We want to start with the so-called continuous mode. Generally speaking, this is the normal mode of operation, which means there is a load attached to the power supply and the current through the inductor never becomes zero. In the following calculations, we want to neglect the voltage drop over the transistor and the flyback diode. Also, we treat the inductor as ideal, which means that its ohmic resistance is zero. The goal is to control the gate of the transistor in a way that the output voltage holds its predefined value, regardless of the load. The gate is hereby switched by a square-shaped voltage with a fixed frequency. Only its duty cycle is adjusted. For the investigation, we will split the circuit into two phases. Phase 1, in which the transistor is closed, and Phase 2, in which it is open. During Phase 1, the voltage over the inductor is the input voltage minus the output voltage. We assume that the output capacitor is loaded to the desired output voltage and is big enough to hold the voltage during the whole switching process. Overall, it is our goal to have a constant output voltage so that is a fair assumption. A constant voltage over an inductor means that its current rises linearly, as we can see with the law of induction. The slope of the current depends on the size of the inductor. It must be dimensioned large enough to prevent going into saturation. Switching off the transistor starts phase two. The magnetic energy stored in the magnetic field of the inductor keeps the current flowing. As predicted by the law of induction, the current through the inductor falls linearly and flows into the output capacitor where it is stored. If we take a look at the voltage loop, we can see that the voltage across the inductor changes its polarity. Subsequently, the current through the inductor rises and falls continuously. This is called ripple current and its mean value is the DC current which flows into the load. If we combine the two equations, we get the formula for the ripple current. In addition, we can derive an equation for the output voltage in dependence of the input voltage. The great thing about this equation is that the output voltage is related to the input voltage solely via the duty cycle. Let's look at a small design example. We want to design a power supply for a 5V output voltage with an input voltage of 12V. We choose a switching frequency of 100 kHz and allow a ripple current of 200 mA. First we have to calculate the necessary duty cycle. 
As we have seen before, it is simply the division of the output voltage by the input voltage. In our case, the duty cycle is 0.42. Now we can use our formula for the inductor value and get a value of 145 microhenries. But what size of inductor do we need? Is a small SMD part sufficient or do we need a 50 kg transformer-like inductor? This depends on the maximum current we want to draw from the output. Each inductor has a so-called saturation current at which the core enters magnetic saturation. If this happens, the inductance drops rapidly. In normal operation, we want to avoid saturation. So we have to choose an inductor with a higher saturation current than the peak current of our application. As mentioned before, all these considerations and calculations are only true for the continuous mode. But if we have no load connected to the output, the output current will fall nearly to zero. Now, because of the diode, the current through the inductor cannot change its direction. This changes a few things in our considerations. During phase 1, the on time of the transistor nothing changes. The inductor sees the voltage difference between input and output and the current rises linearly. When the transistor switches off, everything looks the same at first. The magnetic field lets the current flow and the voltage changes its polarity. But at some point, the current will become zero. Since it cannot become negative, it stays at zero, much like the voltage drop over the inductor. Nothing changes until the transistor switches on again and the whole process starts again. Keep in mind that every time the transistor switches on, current flows into the capacitor and charges it. If we do not reduce the duty cycle, the voltage at the output will rise and rise. Hence, we must actively regulate the output voltage over the duty cycle. We will deal with regulation a little bit later. First, we have to take a look at the boost converter. Reducing voltage is something even a linear regulator can do, but if we want to increase a DC input voltage, we need a step up or boost converter. This is why boost converters are widely used in battery supplied circuits to produce a higher voltage than the battery voltage. The design is similar to the step down converter. At the beginning of the circuit, a capacitor keeps again the voltage stable. But this time, the switching transistor is connected to ground and the inductor is the first element in our circuit. This leads to a few new considerations, so let us go through it step by step. Let us again start with the continuous mode and neglect all power losses in the circuit. If the transistor is switched on, the voltage over the inductor is equal to the input voltage. Not surprisingly, the current through the inductor again rises linearly according to the law of induction. We again assume that the output voltage is stable and therefore the diode is in reverse direction. If we switch off the transistor, the inductor will drive the current into the same direction, but the voltage across the inductor will change its polarity. Now the inductor voltage is in series with the input voltage and that's the trick how we can increase the output voltage. The diode is now in forward direction and the stored energy of the inductor can flow into the output capacitor. During the off time, the current of the inductor will again fall linearly. Seen from the view of the inductor, not much has changed compared to the step down converter. The current through the inductor rises and falls around the average current, generating a ripple. Again, we get the formula for the ripple current and the formula for the output voltage. Theoretically, the output voltage can become as high as we want, but due to losses and finite switching times, there is of course a practical limit. For a small example, let us take a 12 volt input voltage, which we want to convert into a 48 volt output voltage with a ripple current of 50 milliamps. The necessary duty cycle is 0.75, and if we use our formulas to determine the inductance, we get an inductor with 1.8 millihenry, which can be quite large in size. 
Again, the conditions for non-saturation and for the discontinuous mode are the same as for the step-down converter. The current through the inductor ideally has to be smaller than the ripple current. Now let us compare a few characteristics between the two converter types. With a step-down converter, for instance, short circuit protection can be easily achieved. If a short circuit happens, we can simply switch off the transistor and both the circuit as well as the load are safe. For step-up converters, short circuit protection is much harder to realize. If we switch off the transistor, the current through the inductor becomes higher and higher. If we let the switch on, the output is directly connected to the input and the steady current will flow. Another big issue is the control of the gate of the transistor. For a step-up converter, the gate voltage is referred to ground, which makes control very easy. For the typical step-down converter, the gate is floating, what makes it a little bit tricky to control. But there are also topologies for the buck converter, where the MOSFET is connected to ground. Unfortunately, here we must deal with the problem that the output voltage is no longer referred to the input ground. For the typical step-down converter, the input current is discontinuous. This means high current during the on time of the transistor and practically no current during off time. This can produce high conducted electromagnetic emissions, which typically does not agree with the grid operator. This has led to the development of so-called power factor correction circuits, or short PFC. For the step-up converter, the input current is continuous. This is much easier to control in terms of electromagnetic interference. The current from the inductor into the output capacitor, on the other hand, is continuous for the step-down converter and discontinuous for the step-up converter. That's a plus for the buck converter, since continuous current means less stress for the capacitor. As we have seen in our calculations, the value of the inductor has a huge impact on the ripple current. A bigger inductor means a slower rise of the current and therefore a smaller ripple current. But a large inductor is often undesirable, since its mechanical size becomes bigger and it gets heavier. We must therefore find a compromise between low ripple current and the size of the inductor. An increased switching frequency reduces the size of our inductor. But then again, the switching losses of the transistor rise with frequency. If the frequency is too low, we are able to hear the mechanical movement of the inductor due to the Lorentz force, which is the main reason why we tend to choose a frequency above 20 kHz. Now that we understand the fundamental principles of switched mode power supplies, we still need to talk about how we can set a suitable output voltage and how we can hold that voltage at the desired level if the load changes. What we need is a closed control loop. We can regulate our transistor only over the output voltage which is called voltage mode regulation. Or we can regulate it over the inductor current, which is called current mode regulation. In voltage mode regulation, we simply measure the output voltage with a voltage divider. A following PI regulator circuit allows us to change the behavior of the circuit. If the output voltage falls, the output of the regulator gives us a rising signal and vice versa. This signal is converted into a pulse width modulated signal. The sawtooth generator gives us a fixed frequency, and the output of the Pi controller changes the duty cycle at the gate of the transistor. When using voltage mode regulation, we know nothing about the current through the inductor. The regulator only reacts to a change in the output voltage. This can lead to problems. If the load at the output is too high, the current through the inductor keeps rising, which can lead to thermal damage of the inductor. Therefore, a voltage mode regulator always needs additional protection circuits. The advantage of the current mode regulator is that the inductor or the transistor current is measured directly. If a certain current value is reached, the transistor switches off. Like with the voltage mode regulator, the current mode regulator measures the output voltage 
but the output value of the following PI controller is compared with the current through the transistor, which is measured with a sense resistor. If the voltage at the sense resistor reaches the threshold voltage of a comparator, a flip-flop changes its output state and the transistor switches off. Once the current has decreased again, a clock generator, which also gives the fixed switching frequency of our power supply, switches the transistor on again. Therefore, and because of its very stable control behavior, the current mode regulator is used in more or less all modern regulator ICs. As we have seen, secondary switched buck and boost converters are excellent examples to show the fundamental principle of switched mode power supplies. Even though the functional principle is easy to understand, they are very important and have replaced linear voltage regulators in most modern consumer electronics. I'm Christoph with the Institute of Electronics. We hope you have learned something today, but anyway, thanks for watching. For the interested viewer, we highly recommend The Arts of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill and for our German-speaking viewers, Elektronische Schaltungstechnik, written by members of our institute.